good uh, morning, everybody. This presentation is called The Wizarding World of SC Linux. And um, my name is Paul Arnold. And I am a cybersecurity engineer in the defense sector. And I'm, I'm here locally. I live in Orlando. Um, I've been working with Linux since 1999. Um, and I have experience with SC Linux pretty intensely in the last four or five years. Um, and before I get any further with this, I'm going to just do this real quick. Any, any opinions or views that are in here in this presentation and this talk are my own, and they don't express views or opinions of any of my past employers or UCF or any of that nature. All right, so the reason that I'm doing this talk is because SC Linux is not magic, and that's what I want to try to tell people. I, I, I want to get people at least to understand what it is, because I know a lot of times it's just disabled. That's I've read many things where the first thing you want to do is disable it. Well, I, I, I want to at least have you all understand what you're doing when you disable it and hopefully stop a few people from disabling it because you're disabling a lot of security features that are, that are inherent to some of the policy there within. So I'm going to go over four kind of sections of this presentation. Um, in the beginning, I have to go over four terms because if I don't, I'm going to lose a lot of people because there is some jargon in terms that are involved with SC Linux. I picked some specifics that are just going to help with this presentation to really kind of understand. I'll, I'll cover what it is um, and where it came from. And then I will uh, cover with dealing with SC Linux and some of the tools you can do to, uh, tools you can use to troubleshoot or, or modify things and, and find out what's going on instead of just outright disabling it. Um, and then I have a short demo at the end that shows some of the differences uh, with a system that has SE Linux enforcing on versus it off and the security holes that you've really opened up by turning something off. All right. So does anyone know what movie this is from? Maybe hard to see. Hackers, yes, it is Hackers, and I'm sad to say this is not the first Hackers reference in this besides Weekend. So, all right. What does Hackers have to do with SE Linux? Well, okay, it's a bit of a stretch. I just really want to put a hacker's reference in this presentation. But uh, uh, so there's a, uh, a book that's being passed there. It's called The Orange Book. If anyone's familiar with the Rainbow Series books from the 80s, it's kind of where we got the definition as we know them today of what is two types of access control that I'm going to cover real quickly, which is discretionary access control and mandatory access control. Um, and uh, I'll start with discretionary because it's the more traditional one that you'll see on, a, uh, on operating systems. Um, this allows users to specify access control, access controls over objects, you know, like files or directories or whatnot, at their own discretion if they own them. So users can make their own policy decisions. And, uh, and that can be whether it's intentional or accidental. Now, you, in contrast, you have mandatory access control, and I'll do my best to make this brief and understandable. So it consists of a security policy that defines rules, so like a rule set over all subjects, which may be users or services, uh, something that acts upon information. And then you have objects, which, be like, which would be like files with store information. And then that's enforced by the kernel. And this is, a, this is a deny by default kind of enforcement. You have to explicitly allow something to happen. And in addition to that, the official definition of mandatory access control, all subjects and objects have a classification label and category, which are used by the kernel to make access control decisions based on a level of trust and a need to know. Now, it, this is commonly associated with government things, classification. It doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, I know it's, it's much more prevalent in a government uh, environment, but um, I kind of like the, the Gen 2 hierarchy of classification for corporate, which is public, internal, confidential, strictly confidential. So it doesn't have to be government only, but that's generally where you see it right now. And um, the main difference here between the traditional and discretionary is users can't make their own policy decisions. That role is, that, those rule sets are generally made by like a security admin in a perfect world. And users and admins, they can't, make a change whether it's intentional or accidental. And um, I'll cover a little bit more once I get done with these two more terms, almost done the terms. 
All right, so this is probably the most important thing to understand for the whole presentation is context, which are also known as labels. This is very critical to this talk. And um, specifically to this talk in SE Linux, a label can be broken down into two sub-definitions here that I'm going to be talking about. One of them is types. And um, types are labels associated with all objects and subjects. It's just that's, that's the name for the label that's on everything on the system. And the rules for these types will be defined in that policy and then enforced by the kernel. And there's one more, a domain. And this is specifically a processing domain. Um, this, is a, this is a specific type for processes or a collection of processes um, within their own processing domain. Now, it, it's a little abstract. So an example of this would be like, um, like a, the bind uh, DNS uh, daemon, which uh, name, like named uh, that everything would probably be in a type called named which is the named domain, or a single function like the passwd domain, which is for password changes on a Linux system. All right. So what is? Uh, I don't really know. So, um, I figured I made a paper and then I had to actually do it. All right. Uh, so it stands for Security Enhanced Linux. And uh, um, it began as a joint effort between University of Utah and uh, the DoD to implement a mandatory access control for Linux because uh, the traditional mandatory access control systems within the government were kind of expensive and proprietary. Uh, so the NSA actually released the SE Linux as a, SE Linux as a kernel patch under GPL in 2003, um, and I, I believe it became officially accepted into the kernel around 2005. Um, one of the great things about it is it's very flexible. Like, uh, for instance, SC Linux's default on Android now as of 4.3-ish. Um, and it, it, so it can be on something as small as a mobile device to uh, you know, your general purpose desktop, like at home, or uh, a multi-level security system, which I'll get into later, which allows for data to exist at multiple classification levels on the same system and you won't have any knowledge of a higher classification even being there. But I'll get to that a bit more later. So I said earlier that one of the most important things to understand was the labels. So ultimately, if any, you get anything out of this, SE Linux is a label-based security system. Everything within SE Linux relies on labels. So everything on Slash, for instance, on a, on a Linux system uh, has a label. That includes files, sockets, it, it, devices. It's everything has a label. It doesn't, it doesn't know what kind of rules to apply, and it just falls apart. Um, the policy that it, the SE Linux policy, which is kind of a, it, it's a binary policy that's stored in kernel space. And um, it's used by this security server, which is SE Linux, to make those access control decisions. Um, and, and that's what the mandatory access control is. It has to be explicitly allowed in order to do anything. All right, so there's a, there's a few things I want to cover what SC Linux isn't, um, because there's some misconceptions I've heard from now, now and then. It's not antivirus or anti-malware, although it may, con it may um, contain uh, one, uh, a virus or malware on a system, but it doesn't prevent, it, it doesn't detect them, like it doesn't have any heuristics or anything of that nature to detect them. It's not an intrusion detection system, although you could link it up with audit reports and kind of make it that way, but it, it isn't an intrusion detection system. It's not a firewall, and um, it's still not magic. Um, but uh, move on to, uh, there's kind of three main components that, it, that it's made up of. There's the actual like kernel code. That's the Linux security module. Um, I'm not going to get too much more into that because you're getting into kernel development, and then it's, uh, uh, I would get bored talking about it. Uh, so the only important thing to note here is that the discretionary checks, the traditional checks, happen before any of this uh, security module checks would occur because it's much quicker. Um, but the opposite is not true. If, if discretionary, uh, let me back up a little bit. So if a discretionary check fails, it's not going to check the mandatory one. If a discretionary check passes and mandatory fails, well, you still fail. The mandatory overrides everything there. Um, 
the policy, for instance, and then we'll move on to the policy. It's, um, it's very flexible. Like I said, you can have mobile devices, the huge servers and, and whatnot. Um, and this can be tailored to the needs of the system. Uh, and it, they're also modular, kind of like the Linux kernel can be modular or monolithic. It's the same thing with SE Linux policy. They're all modular at this point. And then I'll, uh, I'll get to some tools later. They're generally used for status and policy action. So I'll pause here for a second. How many people are thoroughly confused? I, okay, do you, do you have any specific? What I'm trying to get at is if you have any specific questions, interrupt me right away. Because this, I'm covering a lot of stuff that may be kind of conceptual at this point, And I don't want to lose any people before we get, get moving on. So if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Um, all right, so there's three main policies. Um, the one that, that comes on by default in Red Hat, CentOS, Fedora, um, and it's available for Gen 2 and Arch Linux. Uh, Ubuntu's kind of moved away from SC Linux. Uh, they're all, all three, but all three of these policies are based on a reference policy which the NF NSA developed. Um, and uh, all of these policies, like everything with SC Linux, are denied by default and allowed by exception, as this is a mandatory access system. Um, and the these three policies here are more or less in a hierarchy in terms of targeted being the lowest. Everything in targeted then would be in MCS, which stands for multiple category security. And everything in multiple category security would be in the multi-level security, which is the most enforcing policy. Um, so this, uh, yeah, you can kind of see those. So I'll, I'll take this, this chart here real quick to show you it, kind of the difference between the traditional and the uh, mentor access control. Over here in this yellow, that's kind of the traditional discretionary permissions. You have read, write, execute for owner, group, and everybody. That's, that's what you're used to seeing on a Linux system. And then you have the user and group right next to that. And then you have these, these other <laughs> multiple colored strings next to it. And that makes up what SE Linux asks uh, ads for the targeted policy. Um, these are, so you have, uh, this is the user type, or I'm sorry, the user label, the role label, and the type. But the most important being the type, of course, because that is the main label, labeling system within SE Linux, and provides the basis for how it enforces the mandatory access control. Um, with, so within this policy, this is the one that's the and enabled by default one, you see. Uh, the user role and type is required, and the, the sensitivity and category, which is more or less classification and category, um, those two are not mandatory. Um, but I'll get into the next one real quick. So in these multi-category and multi-level policies, all five of the labels are required. And the difference between the targeted policies and these policies are that this, this kind of red, green, orange, and yellow thing that are, that's at the end there. And that's the sensitivity, which is more or less a level of trust that that, uh, that user has or um, that service has been allowed to operate at. And then you have categories, which is more or less the need to know. And these are all, yeah, these are all government-like terms. But this certainly can be applied to corporate. You could have a category of HR and a category of finance. And they probably aren't going to talk to each other. They're probably not going to have interactions with the files that are specifically finance or specifically HR. Well, I'm, it's just a poor example. But anyway, um, this, is, this can get very complex in here in the MLS stuff, so I'm not going to get too in-depth with it. I actually would have loved to do an entire presentation on this, but I also wanted people to show up for my talk. So um, yeah. I'm not going to go too much further than that. Um, MLS is a Bella Lapudula uh, security model, if anyone's familiar with that. So the security level, a user at a certain security level may not read an object at a higher level. And a user at a certain security level may not write at an object lower than its level. So that's how it enforces the multi-level. And um, just one final thing, the uh, multi-category security is the default that is um, 
in Android SE Linux. It's kind of more or less sandboxes applications from one another. Uh, and it's also used in the uh, um, Red Hat Atomic project, which is SE Linux on Docker. All right, so all of these policies provide confinement. And uh, they confine and constrain objects and subjects as they are defined in the policy, the rule sets. And um, basic, so for instance, SE Linux can uh, confine an, an application within its own domain. So it has a label that belongs to that type of application. And um, allow it to have only the minimum privileges required. And uh, this is important uh, coming up in the demo that I'll show you what happens when that, that's no longer the case. So should an application require access to another network and it wasn't explicitly allowed, it would have to be explicitly granted within the rule set. Um, so yeah, once again, this is a deny by default, and this is what makes it mandatory access control versus discretionary. Um, and uh, this confinement also allows for a great, a great way to prevent further exposure. If you have, say, a web server that gets compromised, well, that web server can't do a your DNS, thing of that nature, um, just because it's it's confined with its explicitly allowed set of rules. It's allowed to. Uh, Perform. All right, so this is a term I kind of made up. Unconfined is a real thing, but unconfined compromise is something I just made up here. This more or less came about because there used to be a policy called strict, and that's what led to a lot of people disabling SE Linux because everything had to be defined. So there was kind of there was a compromise. Unconfined came out, and um, this basically allows demons that SE Linux doesn't know about to run if SE Linux doesn't know about them in a non-confined domain. It's more or less an entirely permissive domain where it's, SE Linux rules are not enforced. Um, so while this isn't, I mean, in a perfect world, we'd have allow rules for everything and everything else would be denied, but realistically, it can be very difficult to do, especially on a system that may not be of super high importance. And uh, I think that's another reason that you'll see a, SE Linux disabled for a lot of the time. So this is better than outright just disabling SQL Linux. So you have your services that have rules defined by generally Red Hat. And uh, if you can keep certain areas defined, especially important services, if you have any public facing services like a web server or DNS or anything, anything of that nature, it'd be good to keep them confined. And, uh, that, and uh, still run other internal things that you may need to run in a non-confined domain. Um, so I, I think it's a decent compromise because you don't completely lose your security. Um, but it's not perfect. But then again, we're not a perfect world. So uh, this, by the way, is the default type of uh, user label and role label and type in the targeted policy for a user. So if you were just to pull up a console and type IDZ, uh, it would tell you that you're unconfined. All right. We're going to move along a little bit here. So this is not a part of SCLinux, but it's very important. Because anything, any important information for SE Linux goes to the audit logs. Um, and we will, I'll show you that a bit more in the demo later, because it's important uh, in the case that it can be used to automatically generate modules to allow something that has already failed. Um, and we are going to move on to living with SE Linux. And what I found, this is how most people live with SE Linux, and this may be difficult to see. This is Google Trends. And I put in SE Linux, and the top result for the related search was SE Linux disabled. Uh, and then we have another one down there at the bottom, SE Linux disabled CentOS. So um, I'm just going to ignore whatever this be. I'm going to call this 130% of people want to disable SE Linux. Um, so I, I'm, I'm trying to change that a little bit, or at least have you understand what it is. So this is from an older document that was published by the maintainer of uh, the SE Linux tools and, and uh, packages for Red Hat, Dan Walsh. So I got like, what, 15 minutes into the presentation without mentioning him. Uh, these are the four most common causes of errors, and this pretty much is top down. If you have a label problem, you're going to get an error. That's the most common thing you always see. Um, the second one, for instance, uh, say you want to run Apache on a port that's not 80, not 443, not 8080, not one of the ones in policy. Uh, that's going to cause an error. Uh, and then, uh, to a lesser extent, a bug in policy or application can occur. And if you're compromised, good luck. 
so we have the tool sets here. I did then ah, English is hard today. Uh, SE Linux tool sets. These packages aren't included by default, which um, kind of bugs me because those because a lot of the distros that come with SE Linux come with it enforcing by default. The most important one here at the top is SE or the Policy Core Utils Python. It comes with one of the most important commands to even like add an additional port. Like you want to run Apache, like I said, on 9090 or something of that nature. You can't do it with the default uh, package groups that you get for most of these operating systems, which is kind of terrible. And you really, really need SE Manage in order to be able to do that. And that comes in that top package there for Policy Core Utils. And um, I'll demo some of the pack. I'm going to go over some of them real quick, and then I'll get into the demo of what they, um, what they can do. These are the two most basic things. This is how you would turn on enforcement of the policy or turn it off. And the following one is the status of it. So it's set enforce and get enforce. Pretty straightforward, pretty basic. Um, another pretty basic one, there are a lot of switches or booleans that are, bu that are built into policy. Um, for instance, this, was, this is one for uh, things that are uh, virtual d devices, if they're allowed to use the host USB, which is actually on by default, which I don't really like, so I use this as an example to turn it off. So you can set that, um, and then you can get it, get the current status of whatever there may be. And I'm going to move through these a little quickly because I want to I want to do the demo portion. Restore con means restore context. So within the within the policy that's defined, all your types will have labels already defined for wherever that file may be. Um, there's a ton of regex in there that defines certain areas. Um, and you can tell this command to restore the label of a file. That it, it's very helpful, very useful. Um, certain certain uh, operations will uh, not relabel a file. If, if you move it, for instance, it won't be relabeled. So this comes in handy and gets rid of uh, errors, pretty, pretty common errors. All right, these are uh, two nearly magic commands for some people. So if you get a failure and, uh, in SE Linux, you're preventing something from happening, you can um, pipe that error, um, pipe that error through um, audit to allow, and it will automatically create an SE Linux module for you, allowing whatever just got denied. Um, this takes seconds and uh, can prevent you from completely disabling SE Linux, and if that happens, I'm happy. So that's my goal here. And there's, a, there's one, th one thing, this is not related to SE Linux, but it can be important. It's, uh, this is a search capability for the audit engine. You can search specifically for audit, um, I'm sorry, for SE Linux denials, so it can be quicker. And then the command that may actually be magic, this does everything possible that you would need to do with an SE Linux policy currently running. Um, it add ports, add additional context, mirror context, all kinds of things. And then all the... All the kind of traditional core utils for Linux, like we have list and ID and PS and Netstat and all those things. If you add capital D to them, that generally will show you the uh, SE Linux label. All right, so moving on to a demo, which um, probably will blow up horribly since this is live. And uh, if it does, so is, I'll ask it again. Is anyone thoroughly confused at this point? Sure, go ahead. They are stored in policy. The labels are defined in policy. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a binary policy. And um, those labels are defined. They were defined in the original reference policy, and they've just kind of been inherited at this point. If you were to start something from scratch, you could define whatever you would like, but uh, that's quite an undertaking. All right, I'm gonna mirror this. Oh wow, that's a much different resolution than I was expecting. All right, is this legible anyway? All right, all right, cool. All right, so first thing we're gonna do is this is in it. This has SE Linux on right now. Um, I can sh show that SC Linux is currently enforcing. So there's certain things that it prevents you from doing. I want to see what, uh, what's up with the shadow, oh, I, I can't even list the shadow file. So that's traditionally where password hashes are, are kept. So 
Yeah, you don't want to be able to do that. Another thing is this is a, um, I guess I should mention, this is a confined user. Um, so it doesn't have permission to do very many things. Uh, this is just the regular user, but it is confined. And I'm using this as an example of what happens within a confined domain. It's the easiest to show you with the user, but you can have, apply a type of domain to anything else, whether it be like an Apache domain, domain and I don't mean like, like a website, within the HTTP type of domain. Um, I want to show the constraints that can be put upon something and then what happens when you turn them off. So um, let's just say that this person is not very, uh, this is a malicious user, and they want to try to share their directory <laughs> as, a, on a, as a web server. So you can, I just tried to run a, a simple HTTP server from Python and it just completely blew up. And um, if I were to go back over here, this is a root on the same VM. So I want to display the current, the current errors that just came through within the last uh, five minutes, either five or 10 minutes, I don't remember what recent is. Um, it'll tell you what's going on. This is hard to read if you've never seen this, um, but it'll tell you why it denied it, and it's always within these curly brackets. So when I tried to use uh, sudo, uh, it, I, it denied me for a set UID capability. And uh, what I was, down here is where I tried to start the web server. It was preventing me from doing a name bind. And uh, there's one more portion to this, let me clear this. So I also maybe want to see all the processes on the system. Oh no, I can't, I can only see mine. Because this is a confined domain. All right, so I'm going to do something. This, this is command hopefully none of you have ever run. So I've disabled SE Linux. And uh, uh, let's try some of these things again. Um, so I can stat shadow now. That, that's fine. The permissions are zero, 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 so I'm not going to be able to actually read it as an unprivileged user because DAC is actually, the discretionary access control is preventing me, so there, there's some security here. And by the way, this is a CentOS machine, this, uh, this VM, and it's completely stock. This is from CentOS installed. Um, policy is completely stock. I installed the policy core utils and that's it. So there's no major changes being done here. So um, the process list, before I saw my four processes, but now oh, I kind of see a lot more than that because I'm no longer confined by anything. So I can just see everything running on the system. Um, all right, so let's do something else real quick. Uh, not a symlink because it's really a symlink. All right, so I want to start up that Python server again, see if that does something. Okay, so I just started a web server out of my, I guess, compromised domain. What's this? IP. All right. Hey, cool. And there's my not a symlink, which I kind of symlink back to dot dot slash dot dot, which leads me to the root of the system. So I can just, I don't know, go through Etsy. Pass the beauty, maybe? Oh, look, downloading it. Hey, look, I've passed the beauty. That was kind of cool. All right. What else I had on here? Oh, yeah. Like sent. I knew there was something I had on there. All right, so I'm going to show one more quick demo on here. And, and this is more of a, a, a sysadmin kind of level thing that would occur. Set force. I'll turn this back on. So a common thing is to, you want to run a web server on a different port, but uh, SE Linux is going to prevent it. So in this case, I do have Apache on here. So I actually lied. I installed Apache as well. Sorry about that. All right, so I already have this pre-configured. I'm going to add a different port of 991, which is not a default port. So if I actually try to start, or I might have already been running. Uh, service. So it fails because it's not a default port. So, sorry about this resolution. It was a little bit difficult to see. It's a similar kind of error that we were getting before with unable to name bind. The same thing I had with Python. Although we can make this pretty simple through the use of that audit to allow command that I was showing you. 
This isn't the best way to do this, but I really want to show you how audit to allow can really make this easy. Um, all right. Well, the web server's down. I mean, I can't even show you that. So I can't even show you a denial of any sort. So we have the, the recently denied in here. So the same command that was piping out the errors. I can uh, push this through to audit to allow. And I'll call the module just uh, allow 991 Apache. And this is going to automatically write and generate me a module that I can, uh, I mean, it tells me what to do. It, it's pretty, pretty simple. I can literally run the same thing, se module, and install. So this is going to import it in the, into the se Linux policy. It does take a second because that's to recompile the entire policy. That's why it's hanging here for 10 to 15 seconds. Depends on the speed of the system. Yeah, they, it's it. So um, it is a good point, and I, um, you do have to be specific in what you're putting in there. This is going to. Um, I'd have to look to see what um, the recent one was, but yeah, you need to specify exactly what you want to put in there, just in case you don't have. Right, because it's, it was within the last five minutes. I'm probably good on time, so I could I could have mentioned. It. Um, yes. Sure, yes, yeah, of course. Uh, so, uh, on that topic, uh, yeah. Is there, on the audit trail, uh, run your command again, fill the audit, and then uh, uh, pipe that out. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I could. Uh, exactly what he said, and uh, I thought I was going to be shorter on time than I actually was. Uh, you could just copy it into a text file, for instance, cat the text file and pipe it it to allow and do the same exact thing. That's a safer way to do it. But uh, uh, I kind of wanted to show more of, um, now those are good points. You don't want to allow more than, uh, than necessary. But for instance, I, I'm now able to start the Apache service. And um, I don't want to go to this crazy site. Is it, oh, I probably should go to the port that I just defined, huh? All right, look, so this is the default CentOS page that you get when you start up Apache. So I mean, that. Instead of turning off SC Linux there, I made one module, and it brought it back up and running in, in five, five minutes or so. It was pretty quick. Um, there's one more thing, I swear this, the last part of this demo. So I have a file. This is a, a label-based issue I'm going to show you. This is really common. I have a file here called uh, demo.html. And uh, the label of it is user temp. Can a user temp run out of uh, RWW? Probably not. So we're getting forbidden on a file that has 644 permissions. That should be readable, right? Well, it, it because the label here, the mandatory access control label, user temp, is not authoritative or is not part of policy for that domain. So one of the commands I, I mentioned before, restore context or restore label, uh, demo, right? Call it HTML demo. And I generally do verbose. I did not that time, but. All right, so I change it to HTTP sys content T. So the same thing, I didn't change any of the discretionary permissions. Um, you can read this, the page loaded. Um, that's my clever phrase. Uh, all right. That's pretty much the end of the demo there. I'm going to. Anybody? Yes. So um, be, yeah, when it's not in enforcing mode, yeah, that, that, this, is a, this is a good question. Um, when, for instance, when you're setting up server, a server from scratch or, or something of, of that nature and something comes along like you wanted to use additional ports, like I just showed with Apache, um, it may be more beneficial to run in the permissive mode temporarily because you may have more than one denial uh, that comes through. And uh, after the first one, it's, it, it can't get, move on to the next thing that wasn't allowed. So uh, for non-production systems, that's, that's probably the recommended way of, of going through initially. Because uh, very often, you could come across seven things in a row that get denied. And uh, you don't want to be making seven modules. So that is a very good point. 
to, uh, I wouldn't recommend it in an uh, operational environment, but yeah, that's a very good, good point to, to put it there. All right, so my resolution is not changing back. All right. Well, that's interesting. That's not what I have up here at all. All right, so these are just some resources that um, can be referenced for further information. Uh, the SE Linux Project Wiki is the first link. That's probably the most valuable one on here. The NSA link on here is just kind of historical data. Uh, there's not too much more to that. The Gen 2 Wiki has some real crazy stuff, but it's great. I mean, it's Gen 2. Uh, and then, of course, you got man pages. You can uh, just pull up anything that has SE Linux. And um, if anyone has any further questions, that, that's, that's the end of this presentation. I'll pull up one more slide that had all the kind of a uh, command list of things I wanted to cover. Those, these are things that will help you. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to go ahead. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I'm sorry? How you, how you would review the rules that you set? You said, yeah, um, I, I don't know it offhand, but uh, SE Manage has the ability to, I think it's a capital C, with everything you throw at it, it lists all the local modifications. Um, and additionally, just as a kind of a best practice thing, um, uh, in my operational environments, I will ha prefix any modules I make with like local or or the host name of the system, so you know that those weren't the modules that came with any sort of uh, distri distribution policy. Um, I, I don't know, I don't have it offhand. I believe it's capital C where it shows all the local changes um, when you're looking in SE Manage, and uh, there's sub subcategories of SE Manage, like for context and booleans and whatnot. Um, it's very powerful. Yes. Yes. Yes, you can. Um, so with the di with the distribution modules, um, they sit in a, depending on which ver version uh, or which distro of Linux you're running, they sit in different places. Um, I'm just going to say they're in uh, Etsy SE Linux and then targeted for the targeted policy, all the distribution ones. Um, you'd have to actually remove a distribution module from the active kernel, and then if you wanted to re-add it, you'd have to point back to Etsy SE Linux targeted. Um, but yeah, you can add and remove at will. And uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's rare that I've had to do it with a distribu distribution policy. It, they've gotten pretty good by the time we got to RHEL 6, RHEL 7. But yeah, it certainly can be done. Do we have any, uh, anyone else? All right. Thank you all for coming to this presentation. I know it was a lot, and uh, I want to thank Elena Besides for letting me present on a very, <laughs> a very interesting topic and uh, something that's very uh, close close to me. Yeah, that was weird. All right, see you. <laughs>